welcome to the Turtle Tracks podcast. I'm your host, Brian Van Hooker, and with me today is the one and only Townsend Coleman. <laughs> Brian Van Hooker! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Brian Van Hooker thing show podcast stuff. Here we are. Hi. That was the other title I was planning on, actually. Oh, that was it? The, uh, br- br- the podcast thing stuff uh, yeah. show? Good. I went with Turtle Tracks last minute. How about that? Well, I, I read your mind. It's <laughs> it's a it's a miracle. <laughs> so what's up, bud? Well, uh, so any Turtle fans should know this by now, but um, Townsend Coleman was the original voice of Michelangelo back on the 1987 series. Whoa, what? Well, cowabunga, dudes! Michelangelo here from the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, just kicking it in the old turtle lair. Oh, down here in the sewer, having some pizza! <laughs> Perfect. I guess the, the place I wanted to start it with you, if you don't mind, is uh, how you got bit by the acting bug. Oh, man. Well, I got bit by the acting bug when I was in fourth grade, buddy. Uh, We went to see a production. It was a class trip, a field trip that we took to see a production of Peter Pan. And I I, I sat there. It was the first time I'd ever seen a stage production before. And I sat there in that audience and I watched. And it was a it was actually a youth theater production. So there were, you know, these kids in this show, but they were flying and everything. It was a great production. And I just remember being so mesmerized by that, that I, I it's like I said to myself at that point in time, that's what I want to do. I want to do that. I want to be up there doing that. So that's where the acting bug hit me. It wasn't really until uh, I got into junior high in high school that, um, uh, that I actually got into some stage productions. And once I actually got on stage and, you know, it hit the lights and uh, the costumes and makeup and the music and the whole thing, uh, that's when it really bit me. And so I've been, I've been acting ever since. And how did you get started? Uh, You mean uh, doing voiceovers and such? Yeah. So I know know you had an early career in radio. I was wondering if you'd tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. And, um, and my dad used to be in the radio when I was very young. We lived in Denver at the time. And um, my folks actually met working at NBC in New York, uh, at 30 Rock in New York in the early 50s. And my dad wanted to be a network announcer, and it just didn't work out for him. So he moved us to Denver. He got on the radio there and uh, did that for a couple of years and then went on into other careers. But there was something about that that I think— uh, kind of appealed to me at a very early age. And I kind of had this thing in the back of my mind that I wanted to be on the radio too someday. So here I am in Cleveland, Ohio. I had uh, just gotten married in 1974. And I, through a weird set of circumstances, found myself uh, interviewing with a program director at a radio station in Cleveland who was hiring inexperienced people cheap. <laughs> and and he hired me. I got on the I got on the radio. I was doing uh, weekends midnight to six uh, at uh, this particular radio station. Um, they kept me for about a year and then fired me, as always seems to happen in radio. And then uh, uh, I, I ended up moving right over to another radio station in 1976. Um, it was a disco station uh, in 76 and 77. And then I just I, I, I went from station to station, worked a bunch of different formats over the course of 10 years in Cleveland. And it was during my radio time in Cleveland that I discovered voiceovers because I was the production director at a number of radio stations uh, during that time. And so I was responsible for recording and producing the local radio spots for our station. And... Uh, of course, that being my job, I didn't get paid any extra for it. It was just part of my job. However, I discovered that there were ad agencies in Cleveland who were willing to hire me, who wanted to hire me uh, freelance apart from the radio station and were willing to pay me real cash money uh, to voice these spots. And I thought, well, this is a fine gig and I'd like to do more of this stuff. And so I pursued that and cultivated that and and it got to the point where after a couple of years, I was making more money a year uh, freelancing, doing voiceover work uh, in Cleveland than I, was, than I was working six days a week at the radio station. And I thought, this just doesn't make any sense. And so in, um, uh, in uh, June of 1984, I quit the radio station. I had just turned 30 at the end of May. 
And I quit the radio station with the idea that I was just going to freelance voice work um, in the Midwest there. Well, weeks after that, I got a call from my landlord telling me he was selling our house and we had to be out by the end of September of 84. And I thought, well, I've got three kids that I have to get settled in school someplace before that. So I, I got to be out like by the end of August. And, um, and so I, I started looking around and then I started thinking, wait a second, I've just turned 30. I've just quit a 10 year radio career. I, I have to make a physical move anyway. If I don't get out of Cleveland now and move to either New York or LA and pursue this acting dream that I've got, I'll never do it. And so I, I went out to LA uh, after the Olympics of 84 and just, I'll tell you, Brian, I just rented a car and just drove around looking for a place to live. Um, ended up finding a little place in Glendale uh, to move to and went home. And literally two weeks later, we were living in California. Uh, you know, I, I sold a car. We had a, a garage sale, called the movers. And boom, 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 it happened just that fast. And uh, so over Labor Day weekend of 84, I pulled into to Glendale, California and uh, became a California resident and um, knew only one person out here. But uh, she, God bless her, was able to get me uh, a couple of interviews with some agents. And one of those agents I ended up signing with uh, like two weeks later. And uh, he's still my agent today. And so... I just got really lucky, you know, I mean, I uh, got an agent and they started sending me out on uh, auditions and it was six months later in uh, March of 85 that they sent me out on, on an audition for a cartoon series, which is something I'd never thought about doing, but they sent me on an audition for Inspector Gadget. And I got this little part of Corporal Cape Man on that series for the last 10 episodes of the series. And uh, that's what launched me into cartoons. I never even thought about doing it, but having done those episodes and seeing kind of what that was all about, I asked my agents to please send me out uh, on more of that kind of stuff. And it kind of became my career, that along with uh, commercial voiceover and, and, uh, and on-camera commercials uh, as well, uh, and a little bit of theatrical work, but... Um, and then in 1993, I launched into promos. So I had, you know, sort of three legs of this voiceover career going uh, and was very, very, very fortunate. Do you still remember what uh, Corporal Cape Man sounded like? Inspector Gadget. Oh, I'll help you, Inspector. I can save you because I am Corporal Cape Man. Oh, so it was uh, Charles Nelson Riley, right? Yes, yeah, sort of uh, sort of a cross between him and, and uh, Ed Wynn. Ish, you know, oh, ho, 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 ho. right. Uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it was what it was. Come to find out all these years later that uh, he ended up being a really unpopular character on that series. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I started reading comments online like years later. I mean, I'm talking like just a couple of years ago. What I had no idea that people hated that character so much. And so I felt very proud of that, that my first cartoon <laughs> character could be so thoroughly reviled. Uh, was uh, was kind of fun, you know. Well, yeah, so that's 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 how I I ended up getting into animation. Well, speaking of your most reviled role, I guess moving on to uh, I mean one of your two most beloved ones. Works let's sense. let's talk about the stuff that everybody <laughs> hated that you did. <laughs> yeah, so the beloved, oh beloved, yes. Tell me. Uh, so how did you? Uh, when did Michelangelo come across your desk or? However it came. Okay, yeah, well, um, so I, you know, my agents did send me out on more auditions. I got in over at Hanna-Barbera and started doing some shows over there. And uh, I was doing a show called, I was a, a Scott on Teen Wolf in, in uh, the mid-80s. And and then uh, got a show called Fraggle Rock. I was a gobo and uh, architect and wrench on that, on the animated version of that for NBC. And it was out of that that our voice director, a guy named Stu Rosen, uh, who was uh, directing uh, Fraggle Rock, came into one of the recording sessions one day and he said, you guys aren't going to believe what I'm going to cast and direct next. And he opens his briefcase, pulls out an, a copy of a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle uh, comic book. And he showed us. And we all kind of skinnied our eyes and said, 
okay, good luck with that, you know. And he said, no, seriously, I'm going to be directing this, and so I'll, I'll bring you guys in on it. Well, Rob Paulson and I were working together on Fraggle Rock, and he brought both of us in along with everybody else in town, and we all auditioned for all four Turtles, and I was lucky enough to get cast. Rob was lucky enough to get cast, and uh, along with uh, Cam Clark and, and uh, Barry, Barry Gordon, and uh, as the Turtles, uh, and then, of course, the the rest of the stellar cast. But um, so that's how that came about. It was uh, just another audition, you know. And honestly, Brian, you know, when we started, I mean, the concept was was just so bizarre, but bizarre enough that I think we all thought that, who knows, maybe this thing has legs. Well, little did we realize, you know, what kind of legs um, it had then and continues to have now. Do you remember uh, when you were auditioning for all four parts, did you have a, a preference as to which turtle you'd become? I didn't, you know, um, really. Uh, it was, I thought, well, you know, I felt real good about my audition and, you know, my character choices. And I thought, you know, like everything else, it's just, it's the luck of the draw, you know. Um, you win some and you lose some and you're thankful for the ones you win and you just, you know, you just move on past the ones you didn't get. Um so for me at the time, it was, it was like just, a, a, it was just another audition, you know, n nothing really special about it. Uh, so I didn't have a, a, a preference. I certainly enjoyed auditioning for Michelangelo, um, you know, because they were specifically looking for that surfer dude. Uh, the, uh, the prototype that they gave uh, in the audition was of Sean Penn in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, his Spicoli character. And yeah, so I felt good about that. I, but uh, I felt pretty good about all the characters. So, you know, and I'll be honest with you, when they cast us, they knew that Barry was going to be uh, Donatello. They knew that Cam, they knew that uh, Rob was going to be Raphael, but they hadn't decided yet whether Cam was going to be Michelangelo or Leonardo. And same with me. And they were going to make their decision uh, at the first recording session. So we went into that first session and Stu, the voice director, said to me, said, Tony, why don't you do Michelangelo first? Cam, you do Leonardo first and we'll do the first pass that way. And then we'll do another pass of the recording uh, and just switch you guys. And we said, great. So we, we did the first pass that way. And then when it came to the second pass, uh, they were concerned about other stuff in the, in the control room. And so I asked Stu if he wanted us to switch, and he said, no, no, he seemed very distracted. He said, no, 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 just keep it the way it is for now. We'll worry about it later. And so that was that. So we did another pass. I remained Michelangelo, and Cam remained Leonardo. And that, that was it. Uh, they just never tried us the other way. And so, <laughs> you know, I mean, again, it was sort of a flip of the coin. I mean, Stu could have said, Tony, why don't you do Leonardo first? Cam, you do Michelangelo first, and 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 then we'll switch. Uh, but that didn't happen. So, yeah, so so that's uh, how Mikey came about for me. Huh, go figure. <laughs> go figure, indeed. See, it's like, go figure, <laughs> dude. It's like, how, how do you figure something like that? I don't know. You just have to go figure. But I don't know how to figure. Well, you got to just go figure. <laughs> it goes to show the, the kind of happenstance that plays into so much of this. Let me tell you, my I feel like my whole career has been like that. You know, it's just, there is, I remember at one point when during a particularly slow period of my career years ago, I, I was talking to my agent about it and very frustrated. And he said, Tony, let me just tell you that I've seen this happen with actors so many times. And all I can tell you is don't try to make sense of it because it doesn't make sense. You, you, this business doesn't make sense. You'll audition for something and feel great about it and not get it. And you'll audition for something and not feel, feel particularly strong about your audition and get it. You know, it's like, you just, there's, there's, there's just no telling. There's no rhyme or reason to it. So he said, don't make yourself crazy. Don't try and figure it out. Just keep doing what you do. And you know, it comes and goes in waves, you know, it's all cyclical and, you know, you're you're good. You're talented. You'll continue to work. It's just you get some and you lose some, and and you really just have to step back and kind of, you know, not hold on to it with a real tight grasp. You'd have to hold on to it loosely, I think, and be willing to let it go if that's where it's going. 
when you finally, uh, when you guys started recording, what was uh, what were the sessions like? Oh, the sessions were great. I mean, I, I, listen, I love doing animation because, especially now, it's it's one of the few times that I actually get to go into a studio because all my work, uh, my work now is primarily promo work, so I do it all from home. And it can be, uh, well, it's really convenient, of course, and efficient, but it's also really isolating. You know, I just don't get to see people the way I used to. So what made doing uh, any of the cartoon sessions that I did along the way so gratifying and so fun was the fact that I got to be in the studio. We got to all be in the studio ensemble, you know, doing the doing the show together, the whole cast together. And there's a much different um, energy that you get when you're all together than when you go into a studio and just wild line, uh, you know, your lines, uh, just do them all yeah, isolated just by yourself. Now you can do that, you know, and a good actor can make it sound like, you know, he's got all the energy in the world and, and is responding and reacting. Um, but it's, I'm telling you, there's just this like, that you can't quite explain, but it's just a different energy that you get when you're all together. So the sessions, we just had such a blast because we had such a great cast, you know, Renee Jacobs as April and, and Pat Fraley as Krang and Peter Renaday as Splinter and James Avery, God bless him as uh, Splint, as Splinter, as Shredder. Um, you know, it was just always a joy. And of course we had, you know, everybody in town came in and guested on this show from time to time too. You know, we did nearly 200 episodes. So, um, uh, the, 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 the sessions were just a blast. Uh, you know, we all got along so well and, and, uh, remain friends to this day. You know, we're, we're, the four of us are going out together doing these comic cons all over the country. And, you know, we, we became friends back then 30 years ago and remain, you know, best, <laughs> seriously, best buds today. It's like when we go out on these comic cons, it says no, as, as if no time has passed. You know, and 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 we're still all so close. So so the sessions were great. You know, and and that's. But I have to say that it wasn't just turtles. It was that way with with most animation sessions I've ever done. You know, it's just always such a joy and a treat to be in a studio with such talented, um, facile, quick witted, uh, amazing um, actors, uh, people. You know. You know, it's funny, you hear things like like Pixar films are all done kind of piecemeal now. And, like, you know, you can't tell when you watch the movies, but, like, right. I figure there's got to be something lost in that energy when it's a guy alone in a room as opposed to that camaraderie. Well, I, th I think there is something lost. Now, whether the audience picks up on that or not, I don't know, but I but I know that the actors certainly feel it. And, I, and every actor I know would much prefer, well... Okay, so every actor I know, this may not be true for every actor, and especially the big celebs, you know, who are getting the millions of dollars for doing these animated features, which, you know, of course, it's all celebs now uh, doing those things. Yeah, and they they go in and 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 they wildline their their parts, and uh, you know, and they get great performances. And of course, the post production team puts this stuff together in a way that you would never know, you would never imagine that these people were not actually talking to each other. Uh, when they recorded. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I agree with you. I think that there's something lost, you know, and, and, uh, and from my experience, I, if I had a choice, I'd much prefer to be with the cast, uh, than go in, you know, all by my lonesome into a studio and just be there trying to imagine what it'd be like talking to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, Brian. It's hard doing it that way. <laughs> When you came back as Mikey in the uh, in the um, the recent series, was it the whole crew together again, or was it done piecemeal? Uh, no, we were together again. Uh, oh, cool. uh, uh, but I should say it was just it was just the turtles. Um, well, and, and there was an episode that had Pat Fraley in it too, had Krang. Um, so yeah, so we, we we were together in the studio over. At, you're talking about the crossover episodes, right? Yeah. Uh, that the 2012 series did, right? And uh, Rob was Donatello in that series, and of course he was Raphael in our series originally. And so that was a crack up, you know, having him, you know, talk to himself, Donat the new Donatello talking to the old Raphael. Um, 
And they even wrote that into the, one of the scripts, you know, it was a very funny bit. Um, but yeah, no, we were all together again and it was great. I mean, that was the first time that we'd actually recorded together as the Turtles uh, since we did our series. And let's see, we stopped recording our stuff in, I want to say, 1996 or so. So, yeah, it was uh, it was a treat to be able to get together again and actually re reprise, reprise uh, our roles um, together. And for the fans, I mean, those were such special episodes. They were great. Oh, my gosh, yeah. To uh, to backtrack a little bit, so like you were talking about how Spicoli informed Michelangelo. Mm -hmm. I got to say, like, you know, compared to maybe more so than any other turtle, your version of Mikey, I think, informed all future versions of him. Like, if you go back to the original comic books, Mikey, I feel like, of all the turtles, is kind of the least defined. So you got to kind of, I don't know, put him together in a way that I don't think he existed before that and more so than the other turtles did. Yeah. Well, I, I, I appreciate you saying that. Thanks. Um, I was not familiar with the, the comic books when Stu came into that Fraggle Rock uh, recording session that day and showed us this thing. I, I was sort of baffled and I thought, well, okay, you know, cartoons are getting weirder, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, um, but, uh, but yeah, so when I went in to audition for it, I really didn't have much to go on except, that they wanted him as a, a surfer dude. Uh, but the way they, you know, the way David Wise wrote these, um, these, these early scripts, uh, it's sort of made it easy for me because he made him very, very much of a, you know, a, a lovable goofball, if you will, you know? So, I mean, you know, he's the party dude. So it uh, somehow, I don't know that the life that, that, that David wrote into those lines and, and those scripts, um, I guess really helped me define Michelangelo. And so I guess what you're saying is that my Michelangelo helped define subsequent Michelangelo's, which I, I think is very cool. I mean, yeah, when I, when I hear some of the Mikey's over the years, um, there's definitely a familiar quality to them. You know, I'm, I'm not going to say anybody was copying me, but uh, I, I think that the character himself just ended up having so much, um, uh, so much just personality that, that he kind of became what he became. Oh yeah. He became his own, like, like in the early comics, he was just kind of the fourth one. And even though he was the first turtle they drew, he was a little bit undefined. And then suddenly he's this amazing character who's full of life and, you know, uh, greatly steals the show, and it was amazing. Well, again, I'm going to have to credit David Wise and the folks who were writing all those uh, those early scripts um, with that, because without without what without the words that they gave me to read, I probably wouldn't have been able to inject that kind of personality into them. So it's a certainly a a group effort, uh, you know. But, but leave, leave it at that. You know, I think enough credit isn't, isn't given to the writers of that show because, you know, I think so often we chalk off the things from our childhood as like, oh, it's just pure nostalgia. Um, but when I go back and revisit Transformers, I'm like, and it's a great show, but it's, you know, it's just robots fighting each other. Right. There's a lot of really clever jokes about in Turtles that are written there that you didn't catch when you were a kid. Oh, my gosh, Brian. Absolutely. And let me tell you. You know, back in those days when we were recording this series, we had no idea the sort of impact that this show might end up having on kids growing up at that time. And to us, it was, in many cases, sort of just another job. You know, we'd leave our sessions going on to do sessions for other shows. Uh, and and so it wasn't until many years later, you know, and, and we would occasionally get some fan mail sent to the producers and then they would pass it along to us at the recording sessions. And, you know, but that was rare. Um, and just the fact that the show was continuing to be renewed year after year for a decade um, told us that it was popular and that it was a big hit. And of course, when we would meet people um, at events uh, and they'd find out what we did, uh, it was a big deal, you know. So, I mean, from that regard, we knew that that it was a popular series. What we didn't realize was the impact that it was having on on kids during those years. And we really didn't have the opportunity to 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 uh, come to realize that until the whole Comic Con craze hit, and we started doing these Comic Cons, you know, five six years ago, 
and meeting fans face to face and hearing their stories about, you know, Mr. Coleman, when I, you know, when I was seven and my folks split up, the Ninja Turtles was what got me through that, you know, or they might say, you know, Michelangelo, you know, I was bullied as a kid and Mikey taught me how to, how to be strong and to laugh and to have a sense of humor, uh, you know, in, in the face of some really dark times. Um, well, you start hearing stories like that and you look back and you realize, my goodness, the work that we were doing back then really had a, prof- in many cases, had a profound impact on kids' lives. And so, you know, Brian, for that alone, uh, that made that show so worthwhile to work on because uh, honestly, I can't think of many other shows that I worked on that had that same kind of, that same kind of impact on kids. You know, I've, I've worked uh, on a radio drama called Adventures in Odyssey for the last mm, 25 years or so. And, uh, and, and that is full of, uh, you know, great wisdom and great lessons and, and stuff and has had a very positive impact for kids who listen to that and families who've listened to that. Um, but rarely do we get a chance to, you know, work on shows that seem to have that kind of impact on people. And, and when you hear these stories all these years later, here we are 30 years later and these kids are now, you know, I still call them kids, but you know, like you, I imagine, I, I don't know, you know, they're mid thirties, early forties, and now they're raising their kids on our original series. Well, what an honor, what a, what a, what a tribute and what a treat, um, you know, and, and, uh, what an amazing, um, accomplishment for this, for this, uh, franchise, uh, to have carved out that sort of niche for itself, um, in our society. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, I can speak from uh, experience. My my four year old loves the Ninja Turtles. Uh, her favorite's Raph. No offense, but um, <laughs> but she she's grown up on it. Is this the original series you're talking about? I've exposed her to everything, and she's okay. most fond of the original series and the um, <laughs> so and great. the uh, the most recent Nickelodeon, the CGI cartoon. Yeah. Okay. You mean the one that's currently on the air? No, the one previous, the one that had Rob Paulson as Don. Right. So the 2012 series. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that went for five years and was very popular. Yeah. And, uh, and I imagine that Nick is a Nickelodeon is just going to continue, try to fuel this fire as long as they can. Yeah. Which I'm all for. It's, it's cool. Well, you guys help with that too. I mean, like I, I met you at a con recently and, uh, with all the other four turtles and I, I had met Rob Paulson before, but having all you guys in the same place was just a mind blowing <laughs> experience for me. <laughs> yeah. You know, we get that and it, it, it never gets old, Brian. It never gets old. To see the reaction of the fans, you know, when they hear us do our voices or they see the four of us together. And, uh, man, you know, the fans will come up to me at, uh, at a con and they, I'll look at them in the eyes. And, uh, you know, it can be a big strapping, you know, 230-pound linebacker who, who, you know, starts welling up with tears. And you, I look at her and I just say, come here, buddy, give me a hug. <laughs> you know, <'cause, laughs> because all of a sudden he's his six-year-old self again. And... It just that nostalgia, I guess, brings in many cases brings back a lot of a lot of feelings, you know, a lot of a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah. You you definitely feel it again when you see those voices live. And it, it's it's weird. You'd think that would take some of the magic away and it just only adds to it. Bizarrely. It's great. Well, that's so cool. Thanks for saying that. Oh, it's, it's the truth. Uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the tick, at least in passing. So, of course, <laughs> I would be voices. remiss, too. You can't. <laughs> Look, mister, you can't get me on the horn here and not mention me. Oh, great. That's how about that. This is my 16-inch talking tick action figure. Evil is a foot. Yes. <laughs> Evil is a foot. See, I can still do it. How about that? Spoon! Is that you in the voice? Yeah, that's me. I recorded the voice for this toy. Uh... Literally, is a 16-inch blue action figure tick that has about five or six phrases. Let's see what he says here. Spoon! Well, there you go. Yeah. Spoon! <laughs> I still got it, baby. I still got it. And that's a show that's had some lasting impact. You know, it's crazy. I was looking back and... There's only 30-some-odd episodes of that show, but, man, that's a show that's had a heck of an impact, too. Yeah, well, you know, uh, sorry, I was putting Tick back in his his place. Um, 
Yeah, the, the, the t- you know, it, it, that is a funny show because, well, it's a funny show. Uh, but back when we were doing it, and I remember reading this uh, this uh, pilot script, and I was like, are you kidding me? This is hilarious. And... And 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 the and the problem for us back when we were doing it was the fact that Fox Kids wanted they were insisted on keeping it on Saturday mornings rather than putting it on Sunday nights next to the, the Simpsons, which is where it probably belonged more than on Saturday mornings for kids. But the stories that I hear nowadays, you know, when folks come to the uh, Comic Cons and stuff, uh, the tick sometimes feels almost. Um, as as if it were as popular as uh, Ninja Turtles, I get more people kind of coming out of the woodwork saying, "Oh my gosh, you know, when I was in college and and me and the guys, we'd we'd wake up on Saturday mornings and go down to the dorm TV room just to watch the Tick. It was the most hilarious thing, you know. So I, I think maybe Fox, if they had um, played their cards a little differently, uh, you know, the show might have had a little more life to it." Um, but it was brilliantly written, and Ben Edlund is a genius, and I was very lucky to be a, a part of that series. And I remember doing the first episode and meeting Mickey Dolenz for the first time and thinking, oh, my gosh, I, here I'm this superhero, and Mickey Dolenz is my sidekick. <laughs> uh, because I was a huge Mickey fan, because I was a huge Monkees fan when I was, you know, 11 years, uh, 12 years old. And so— and so that was that was very cool for me, you know. But it was the the show was just so well written and was so hilarious, and I it still holds up today. Um, the number of people that I have coming up to me at cons who are uh, as big Tick fans as they were Turtles fans uh, is just amazing to me. Well, I mean, it's a show that ages really well, just because I think, like the Turtles, it just it was so sharply written that it just. It sticks around. It, it holds up. Well, yeah, and it, and it and it just it 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 um, engendered. Uh, that's probably the wrong, wrong word, but but it it spawned. Oh, there you go, evil spawn. Uh, you faced the tick. Uh, it, it spawned so many hilarious lines. I mean, the the lines that Ben and his compadres wrote, uh, not just for the tick, but I mean for all the characters, but especially for the tick. Uh, are just, they're hilarious, you know? And when I have uh, fans come up to me at cons who were fans of The Tick, they always have like a favorite line and they'll start reciting them. And in many cases, most cases, these are lines that I forgot I even said, (laughs) you know? But when they say them, it brings it back to me. And I I remember I go, that's right. Oh my gosh. Don't count your weasels before they pop, dink. (laughs) Hey, you're the guy who made my friend's head hot. Well, you're not going to make my head hot. No siree. There's so many great ones from that show. Yeah, no kidding. You know, we're getting to the end here. I usually... um... Getting to the end. (laughs) Getting to the end. You you had to say that, didn't you, Brian? (laughs) Now we're going to have to quit. (laughs) And I'm going to have to go (laughs) night-night. So we're getting to the end. So normally, no, please, normally I ask I ask my guests who their favorite turtle is, but with the guest uh, with the voice actors who played one, it just doesn't seem to make sense. So yeah, because what would you expect it, me to say? Yeah, oh, I, 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 I love Donatello. <laughs> Donatello is easily my my second favorite turtle. And but then there's Raphael. Oh my, come on! How could you? You know, that's my third favorite turtle. Yeah. And then, of course, I've got Leonardo, you know, and Leonardo is right up there on the list at number four. Oh, uh, so talk I, I would say, uh, oh, wait, who am I leaving out? Oh, Michelangelo. So I would say Michelangelo <laughs> is my favorite turtle. So instead, I'm going to ask you a much more controversial question. Uh-oh. Well, stand back behind the yellow line, please. This could get dangerous. Please keep your okay. hands and feet inside the car at all times. Are you ready? Yes. Actually, maybe I'll actually ask Mikey. Okay, ask Mikey. Yeah, dude, hold on. One more bite of pizza. All right, what do you have? Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Pineapple on pizza? Are you kidding me? Dude, there are so many things that go on a pizza. Pineapple is definitely not one of them. 
anchovy and hot fudge. Why don't you try starting there, dude? All right. Well, I think that that, I mean, <laughs> if, anybody, if anybody can settle that debate, it's going to be Townsend Coleman. It's true. There you go. Finally, huh? Oh, what the world has been waiting for. So do you personally, you don't care for pineapple and pizza? I, I Actually, personally, I do not care for pineapple and pizza. It, it <laughs> does not, it does, no, I'm serious. It does not belong on pizza. It's sweet. It's like a sweet thing. It's like, what? No, 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 no. That's not pizza. You call that something else, but it's not pizza. I personally oh. am a fan, but I'm not going <laughs> to... <laughs> what, of pineapple on pizza? I am, yes. Well, Brian, I'll tell you what. When we get off the air here from this brilliant podcast, I want you to go order yourself a pineapple pizza with extra pineapple. Thank you very much. Uh, honestly, that that wraps it up. Um, <laughs> this has been uh, Turtle Tracks with uh, Townsend Coleman as my guest, and I, I'm just honored to talk to you. Thank you so much. Oh, baby, thank you, Brian. You've been a delight, and uh, again, thanks for being a fan, and I uh, just count myself as one of the luckiest people on the planet. So, thank you for for today. It's uh, been delightful. Thank you so much. All right, dude. Cowabunga! Oh, that's bodacious. When the evil shredder attacks, these turtle boys Leonardo leads Donatello Dust Machine. That's a fact, Jack. 